Okay, I guess it's recording now. Okay, so we jump to our next subject. Um, and this is fluctuations. Um, okay, once again, I'm not, um, I, I don't know to what, to what extent you're familiar with, um, with the subject of fluctuation. So I'll, I'll start slow. Um, so the simplest example of fluctuations, if you have a circuit, um, say a resistor, and even though just resistor and uh, there is a, uh, a permitter there and the permitter measures a function, a current as a function of time. So if you have a old fashioned permitter that measures function as a, as a current as a function of time, that symbolically you will get something uh, that looks like this. And if, if there is no a voltage source, then actually you will get something which symbolically looks more like that, that if you will discuss what is the average value of the current over time, that would be just uh, an integral of a current as a function of time with respect to time over some time window, let's it call time window, I don't know, T bar and divided by one over T bar and take a limit of T bar, T bar to infinity. This by definition would be an average current in this circuit, electric circuit. And if the system is at thermal equilibrium, then we would expect the average value of the current at equilibrium, at equilibrium, typically the average value of the current will approach zero. And and that's, 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 that's the usual, usual situation. You, you don't have typically current in a macroscopic system. If you don't apply, if you don't apply uh, finite voltages. Okay, I'm talking about normal metals once again, it's not, not, um, not superconductors. So just normal ordinary metals in the absence of external voltages, there's no current. And this is not surprising. Now, if you would look at, at the, as the current as a function of time, however, if you, if you have a device that locally allows you to measure current as a function of time, you would see that as a function of time, you always have a signal which is non-vanishing. Sometimes it's a positive current, sometimes it's a negative current. On average, it's zero, but, but, but as a function of time, you, you pick up some signal. And this, this uh, current as a function of time, these fluctuations uh, of a current as a function of time, these are classical fluctuations that we are, we are discussing today. So this is our, this is our uh, subject. Now, why, why, why do we see the fluctuations? Yeah? Why, do we, why do we see what, what, what historically was called noise? And you can, so these, these fluctuations are called noise. And, and from this term, you can already infer that, that originally this noise was, was considered something which was uh, extrinsic, purely, purely experimental and probably related to some uh, um, imperfection in the experimental techniques. Yeah? So if you see something which is called noise, you would typically expect that if you will make your experimental techniques better and better, you will eventually get rid of this noise. Yeah? 
And this is how people treated this noise for, for many years when it was originally, originally discovered. And well, however, however, is, is it probably uh, quite clear, this noise uh, has, uh, of course, it may have something to do with imperfection in the experiment if the experiment is not good enough. But in fact, there is always a part of the noise that has nothing to do with imperfection of the experiment, noise that is always there. And it has to do with some fundamental properties of the of the system, and you can never get rid of them. So where is this noise is coming from? So like I said, we are now discussing system at equilibrium. So it means that if you have a resistor, that that resistor is a classical system. What, what, what do we mean by, by a classical resistor? We mean it's a microscopic piece of metal that has lots of, of particles on it. And this system at equilibrium has a finite temperature. That's almost, almost uh, identical to the, to the statement that the system is at equilibrium. It's, it's to say that it has a finite temperature. And my claim is that once you have a system at finite temperature, that the current that flows through this system there will have a noise that is proportional to this temperature. This is what is called thermal noise. So let me let me formalize this slightly better. So I'm I'm computing current as a function of time. I'm subtracting an average value of this current that I just defined above. And I call this di of t fluctuation of the current at the time t from, from its mean value. If we have thermal equilibrium, then di as a function of t at equilibrium is just equal to i of t. And then I take di as a function of t, multiply it di at time zero and average this object. This is called current, current, sorry, current second correlation function. Since it's the most popular correlation function, people would typically say that it's a current correlation function. I'm meeting the word second. And we will denote this object S2 as a function of T. So this is the current correlation function or noise correlation function. Then what people would typically like to do is to consider this correlation function in the frequency space rather than in time domain. So we defined S2 of omega which is just an integral with respect to t, e i omega t, s2 of t, which is from what I said above, it's an integral dt, e i omega t, delta i is a function of t, delta i is a function of zero, average. This is the, the current correlation function. Do we have an equation so far? Okay, if you don't have a question so far, let, I, I, I have a question. What, what do I mean when I'm saying average? What is the average of current correlation fluctuations? What I mean by this? What do I mean by these brackets? And over realizations of uh, imperfections? Realization, what kind of realization? Um, uh, like uh, different disorders, the different locations of disorders. I have only one sample. Uh -huh. I'm in my lab, I have one sample. I don't have different sample, one sample, one piece of metal. I have no idea what disorder is in it, but there's some disorder, I measure it. 
So what do you mean with relation function? Multiple measurements. Yeah, for example, I can I can I can take my signal. I can choose a time window at which at which I I perform my Fourier transform, make this window long and define and define correlation function as a as an average with respect to many windows. Okay, that's 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 correct. That that what 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 I can do if I'm an experimentalist. What what do I say? What, how do I understand this average if I'm a theoretical physicist? What what does it what does it mean that I average current uh, with this with these brackets? I have a current at the moment t and current at the point zero. What do I do? Uh, the integral of a, a e to minus beta h times the type of operator you want to measure. So exactly. So this is, let me formulate it slightly more carefully. It's a trace with the density matrix of the operator i in the power, time t times operator i in the power zero. And the density matrix, if you don't know what the density matrix is about, don't worry, I will just only mention it for those who do. And at equilibrium, at equilibrium, the density matrix will be exponent minus H over temperature, H being a Hamiltonian of the system and T being a temperature of the system. So if you're a theoretical physicist, what these brackets really means, you compute density matrix and you compute the trace of the density matrix with these operators. Now, what you can show, and this is absolutely a general statement, it's called fluctuation dissipation theorem. That as soon as you have a system that has a linear response, so you assume, assume that there is a linear response. So what it means, it means that the average current in the presence of, of the voltage is proportional to voltage times conductance. Or in other words, current, average current divided by resistance is equal to voltage. You, you apply voltage to the system, you measure current as a response to voltage, and there is a linear linear regime in which current is proportional to voltage. And the coefficient of this proportionality is called conductance, electric conductance. So if you happen to have a sample that has such a behavior at sufficiently small voltages, then for these voltages, so this, this voltage range in, in which this, this thing exists, and it's also known as an Ohm's law in, in, uh, in electricity, then, then if, if this regime exists, you, we can say that, that current, current correlation function computed in the frequency domain. I remind you, this is just a of time domain correlation function. So the current current correlation function computed in the frequency domain is equal in the to omega Katangin's hyperbolic of omega over two temperature times conductance as a function of frequency. And this is called fluctuation dissipation theorem. And this always holds as, as soon as you have 
the only condition that you need is to have a linear response regime if there is a linear conductance, if there is a relation current is equal to G times V at frequency omega, then if this, this is satisfied and the system is at thermal equilibrium, then fluctuation dissipation theorem holds. In particular, if you look at this thing at frequency much, much smaller than temperature, so in this limit, the fluctuation dissipation theorem reads to C times G. So essentially it tells you that the fluctuations of the current are proportional to temperature. And the higher the temperature is, the, the stronger the fluctuations of the current. And the name fluctuation dissipation, it, it refers to the fact that the left hand side of this thing are fluctuations of the current. So these are fluctuations. And on the right side of this uh, equation, you have conductance, which you can easily relate to the measure of uh, joule heat. Because if, if, there is a, if there is a current that flows through the system, then the joule losses will be proportional to I times V, which is, which is, uh, which is what? Which is uh, G times V square. So you can look at G as a measure of dissipation in the system. And therefore you can relate an, an object which is an intensity of fluctuations to the object, which is an intensity of joule losses. And that's, and that's where the name fluctuation dissipation, dissipation theorem came, comes from. Okay, now another important historic remark that fluctuation dissipation theorem holds for system in the presence of interaction. It does not matter how complicated the system is. It, it can be many body, can be many body electronic system with, uh, this, with a strong entanglement in, in many body, in correlated many body state, still, still the fluctuation dissipation theorem holds. So it's a very, very fundamental, fundamental uh, uh, relation. The, the only thing which is restrictive about it that this theorem is limited strictly to the thermal equilibrium. So it does not, it does not allow to say anything about, about uh, noise in the away from thermal equilibrium. Now what, what, what I'm coming to that, that our goal for today at least is to look at the systems that we can describe within our Boltzmann equation, within the familiar Boltzmann equation, and try to see how we can explain noise in this system in, on the same level of accuracy as Boltzmann equation, but away from thermal equilibrium. That's our goal. So our goal, our goal to describe, to understand, noise away from the thermal equilibrium. The price that we're gonna pay for, for being away from equilibrium, that the validity of this approach is much narrower than the validity of fluctuation dissipation theorem. So we will be looking, we consider only, consider only the systems, consider only system, consider only systems that can be described, described within 
Wir sehen den Boltzmann. Equation approach. So we are praying the price of being limited to a narrow class of systems, only system with a semi-classical dynamics close to semi-classical limit can be can be can be addressed. However, however, the, the gain we are making is that we are no longer limited to thermal equilibrium. Okay, and of course, of course, if we look at the thermal equilibrium point, if 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 we look at if we use the approach to thermal equilibrium, we must we must recover the fluctuation dissipation theorem and the classical limit. So that's a sanity check for for analysis that at thermal equilibrium we must we must reproduce fluctuation dissipation theorem because that's that's a fundamental uh, result. Okay, so how are we gonna how are we gonna do it? So let me let me show you using one example. So I will consider a sample, which is a metallic sample. So epsilon Fermi tau, much larger than one. Static disorder. This means that's a good metal. Static disorder, no interaction whatsoever. So free electrons in the presence of static disorder, the simplest, the simplest, uh, probably the simplest model in, in, in physical kinetics. We analyzed this model in details at the beginning of the course when we spoke about Ohm's law. So now we are coming back to this model and trying to, to understand fluctuation in in this in this uh, in this problem. And once we understand that, we we, can, we will be able to generalize it to, to include uh, phonons, electron-electron interaction, and whatnot. So how do we how do we proceed? How do we conceptually allow for fluctuations to be a part of the story? Because if you remember, on the level of Boltzmann equation, we could have only computed the observable quantities, such as an expectation value of the current, expectation value of the density, expectation value of energy density, energy current. But there were no, no, there was no a concept of um, fluctuation whatsoever, right? So there was a, there was our main object was a function f of p, r, and t, and its meaning was a density of electrons in the phase space. at the point P R at the time T. So we were given or we were computing the density of electrons in the phase space. And from there, we have extracted the information about densities and currents of different quantities, but there was no concept of fluctuations in there. So strictly speaking, fluctuations are not are not accessible within a standard Boltzmann equation. You cannot compute fluctuations within a standard Boltzmann equation. So you need to modify a Boltzmann equation in order in order to be able to compute fluctuations to understand fluctuations. So, so I'm gonna describe to you a modification of Boltzmann equation 
but it's it's a very logical and natural modification. So it's an extension, but this extension is intuitively it's very similar to the Boltzmann equation itself. Okay. So how I gonna do it? So when we talk about um, single particle distribution functions f, p, r, and t, we call it the density of electrons in the phase space. So let let me try to to schematically schematically describe the phase space. So I'm drawing a figure, and these cells are uh, describing in small cells in the phase space. So, so it's, so it's for three dimensional problem, this will be three plus three dimensional uh, phase space. Yeah, three dimension are coming from special dimension and three dimensions are coming from dimension of the momentum. So I need to draw a six dimensional uh, phase space. Uh, of course, I'm not, I'm not capable of drawing that, but, but schematically, I can draw a cross section. So let us draw a caricature of this. Let's fix, let us fix all coordinates. So let's fix a coordinate R, and we need, and we need to draw. So this is three dimensional coordinate R. I just fix it. And I have three-dimensional coordinate P, which is Px, Py, and Pz. So let me fix everything, but but just consider two different. So let me set Py to zero, Pz to zero, R to zero, and just consider Px, Px as a as a variable that I can draw on a two-dimensional grid. No, I, on two-dimensional grid, I can draw, I can draw two variables. So that would be Px and Py. Okay. So these will be different. So then in this case, it will be component Px, Px and this will be component Py. This is a cross section of a phase space that I drew. So I divide, I divide my discretize my my momentum, electron momentum, and I and and I draw and I draw small cells for these uh, components of the momentum. So these are finite size cells. So the size of this of each cell is dpx times dpy times dpz times dx dy dz. And the object that we defined so far was a function f, p, r, and t. That was a density, density in the phase space. Density of particles in the phase space. And therefore the entire thing that I just wrote here is equal to number, number of electrons in the cell P R. So I, I, I pick the phase, I pick the cell in a, in a multiply, if I multiply volume of this cell by density in the phase space, I just get how many particles are in this cell. So as you see from this description is sort of coarse grain description because it means that the functions f, p, r, and t does not tell you where precisely this 
these particles are in the in the unit cell, so they just cross coarse grained uh, these things into 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 a cell. So you see from this from this description that I that I need in order for this for this thing to work, these cells need to be sufficiently small because the bigger I make my, my cell, the more information I lose about actual position of the particles in the face plate. Uh, on the other hand, I want these unit cells to be sufficiently, uh, these cells to be sufficiently large, such that on average, I would have sufficiently many electrons in each and every cell, such that I can employ ideas of statistical physics. I don't want to talk about one electron. I want to have a systems. This is sufficiently many electrons such that I can can employ ideas of of uh, statistical mechanics. And now, now I'm going to make a jump and say, okay, so what what we actually once we do divided this, the phase space into unit, in, it's not unit cells, in, into, into cells. Once we discretize the, 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 the phase space into cells, what we actually are talking about, we are talking about numbers, numbers of, numbers of particles within, within the cell. So this is actually how many particles are in the cell at the time t. So, now, now it may sound a bit weird because when I say a number of particle in the cell P, are at the moment t, what do I actually mean when I say that there is a number? Because, because everybody who ever took a course in statistical physics knows that if you have a system at finite temperature, that any quantity must fluctuate. If you will look at, I don't know, Uh, if you look at the ideal gas at thermal equilibrium, take a volume of the phase space and ask how many molecules of the gas is in this uh, volume that we know that you, you, can, you can define this number in average, but you also know that this number will always fluctuate. And these are statistical fluctuations. They have nothing to do with imperfection of the experiment. They have everything to do with just having a system which is described in terms of statistical physics that always comes with some, some degree of uncertainty. So at the moment you say that there is a finite temperature, you immediately imply that there are thermal fluctuations in this system. And therefore, and therefore, when the number of electrons, the number of particles in the in the cell by construction will always fluctuate. So what 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 we actually meant when we used F, P, R, and T as a distribution function in Boltzmann equation, we meant an average number, an average an average density density of electrons in the phase space. So when I wrote here, it's a density in the phase space. There is an important amendment, an important amendment reads an average. density in the phase space, not just a density in the phase space. Because if you will look microscopically, so to say, 
that at each moment of time, these thing, the number of particles in the cell will fluctuate. Purely, purely because, purely because we are using statistical description. Just that will do it. And now you can you can see it in in terms of physical intuition. You can think in terms of uh, 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 quantum computation. You can, for example, those who know second quantization can take a number operator at the at the point P and then just compute its square and correlation function quantum mechanically. Say that the number of electrons in the state P, it's A dagger P A P, and then run with the machinery of of um, field theory and, and and find what is this correlation function. I, I'm not sure that everybody here learn, learned second quantization. So I will probably not go along this line unless you're telling me that everybody here knows. Is anyone here who does not know second quantization? It's a moment to, it's a moment to stop me. Please raise your hand, those who know second quantization. Okay, but there's one person who did not. Okay, okay, just, okay, I guess that for five minutes we can, we can speak about second quantization then go back to our more intuitive approach. So let us think about this quantum mechanically. So number of particles in the phase space in terms of operators, fermionic creation operation. This is the number of particles in the phase space. Oh, everybody knows second quantization, that's good. Then I can speak a bit slow about it. So thermal equilibrium, thermal equilibrium, equilibrium, free electrons. I can com compute an average value of this object, average value of NP. What do I mean by that? Like I said, I mean exactly trace of the density matrix with this operator. What do I mean by that with thermal equilibrium? At the thermal equilibrium, I mean trace exponent minus beta H with, the, with this operator. What is the Hamiltonian at thermal equilibrium? It's sum of a K epsilon K A dagger K A K. So we're essentially computing trace, trace of E minus B sum of a K epsilon K A dagger K A K uh, with, with A dagger P A P and I need to normalize it to, so essentially need to normalize it and this is trace E minus beta sum of a K E K A dagger K A K A dagger P A P divided by trace E minus beta sum over K, EK, A dagger K, A K. And now, and now we can focus here on a single end state P because that's the only thing when this thing is not equal to one. And then there are trace so trace over this state has a, a state where both states are filled. And both states are empty. And I have here E minus beta epsilon K A dagger A P A P A dagger P A P. And here I have A dagger P A P. And also the same object minus B epsilon P A dagger P A P. Here, it gives me minus E beta E P. And this thing drops because the 
a dagger annihilates the vacuum. And I got E minus beta EP divided by E minus beta EP plus one. And this is equal to one, one plus E beta EP. And this is nothing else but our familiar Fermi Dirac distribution function at energy. So that's what I meant by average value of, of this operator computed quantum mechanically, but I can also ask what is the average value of, of, of its square computed quantum mechanically. And I do precisely the same, a dagger P, a P, a dagger P, a P. I'll spare the computation. They are very similar and straightforward. And we will get that it's equal to N P average times one minus N P average. These guys are Fermi Dirac function. So N P is just one over epsilon epsilon P divided by temperature plus one. So what we see from this example that as soon as temperature is not equal to zero, then these guys on average are not equal to zero one. And therefore the this thing has a finite fluctuations. Because the occupation of, of these states fluctuates, it's called thermal fluctuation. If temperature is equal to zero, then N of P is either zero or one. And then this thing drops. Once again, these are thermal fluctuations. So, so now, now we see from here that if we think in, if we think in terms of a cube number of particles in the cells, we know that this, this number must fluctuate and that comes just from quantum mechanical uncertainty principles and, and thermal, thermal fluctuations. Therefore, what we will do, we will try to think about these things in a semi-classical in a semi-classical manner. And instead, so then we, we, we will identify the distribution function we have considered before for the for the entire course as, as a coarse grain average distribution function. We will consider as an average density of electrons in the phase space, but on the back of our mind we understand that actually there is a non-average density of electrons in the phase space. There is a fluctuating density in the phase space. And its average overrealization is what we would normally call distribution function F of PR and T. So a conventional density of electrons in the phase space, it's a coarse grain version of something more microscopic that goes on in the phase space where this, not, where, this, where this density fluctuates. And so we, we are lifting ourselves up a bit to, towards a more microscopic description from a Boltzmann equation. And we will say, so essentially a true distribution function, roughly speaking, consists of a coarse grain distribution function plus some fluctuations of it. And this is the object we have discussed so far. This is what Boltzmann equation describes. And delta F is something that by construction drops if we average the equation over time. So we need to lift ourselves towards a more microscopic theory. We need to guess, essentially, we need to guess uh, what should be the equation for a uh, density of electrons in the phase space if we allow for its fluctuations. Okay, of course, you don't have to guess. You may derive it microscopically if you are 
familiar with um, this Keltish technique and so on. But I think the main idea here, it's a huge advantage that you can actually guess and that, that guess itself is, is quite uh, illuminating. So how would you allow for fluctuations to be added to Boltzmann equation? Let's see if you have any suggestions. Be doing something like we've been doing uh, previously, like adding fluctuations to the function. You're right. So we we will of course say that now distribution function is some average value plus delta f. But now we need to add something to the Boltzmann equation that allows us to compute delta. F. Add, uh, we we modify the collision integral to add. And there is storm like a psi function or something like that. Another uh, another drive. We modify the collision integral. Absolutely correct. Now, how do how do we modify collision integral? And why do we modify collision integral? Why collision integral? Why why not something else? I think it's yeah. a I think because the collision integral is what's uh, driving uh, the, uh, the whole thing. It's the ana not anharmonic and uh, non-homogeneous part of the equation, which is uh, supposed to be derived from the material. So if noise comes from the material and not from the physics, it should be in the collision integral and how uh, looking at the equilibrium part plus another term or something like that. Okay. It, it was partly, it was partly true. So I think it's, it's a, I think it's a good, it's, it's a good start. Yeah. So that's, we need to we need to we need to say in words that now um, that we we're gonna treat we're gonna treat Boltzmann equation of course as a propagation part and collision integral. So propagation part describes how 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 um, uh, density in the phase space propagates through the phase space. And we are going to make a conjecture that the density propagates through the phase space in the same manner, whether it's, it's an expectation value of the density or it's fluctuation. So it's just being particular being just moving freely through the phase space. So that's, that's the, that's the Louisville part of the collision of the Boltzmann equation is telling us. Uh, but, but about collision integral, we're gonna we're gonna say something uh, additional, and we're gonna say that a collision by by construction comes from some quantum mechanical scattering process. In the simplest case of static disorder collision, so you have some potential V of R, and there is an electron that comes with the momentum P and scatters to the state with the momentum P prime. And, and you have a home assignment when you need to compute a scattering probability from state P to P prime, and you computed the scattering probability using quantum mechanical, quantum mechanical scattering theory. Now you know in quantum mechanics, in quantum mechanics, all processes and in particular scattering processes are probabilistic. So what we actually meant when we said we computed scattering probability, we said that on average, on average, particle with the momentum p 
will go to the state with the momentum P prime with probability P P prime. But by saying on average, we already implied that in this process is a random process. So if you'll be keep sending, if you'll be, if you will be sending reluctance with the state P on the potential V, in each particular exam experiment, you will end up having different results. On average, the distribution of the scattered particles will be given by WPP prime. But in each particular scattering event, the electron may go from state P to, to some any to some other state. And that's what, what would happen. Yeah? So scattering in quantum mechanics is by construction a random process. Therefore, there is some randomness inherited on the level of scattering and the level of collision. So any type of collision unavoidably um, unavoidably is uh, affiliated with, um, uh, with, with randomness. And so what, how we're gonna mimic this, we're gonna mimic it by saying that we, we had a Boltzmann equation, dt plus v p rat r, uh, rat r, sorry, acting on distribution function, uh, plus uh, minus collision integral on f of p. Now we say that was a Boltzmann equation. That was something that happened on average. Now we are saying now distribution function will be an average plus delta F. And each and every object here, we understand that what happened on average, but in particular scattering collision integral. That was something that we understood on the level on average, but in each and particular case, the outcome may be different. So this randomness, we will encode by writing random Langevin source on the right hand side of this equation. So we are adding something random to the right hand side of this equation. And of course, the condition is that on average, this thing drops. Because the collision integral, and let me be more specific, and write the collision integral for the case of, let me write this as a plus sign, I think that was our convention. The collision integral that we wrote for static disorder, that was a combination of two types of processes. Processes that brought electrons to the state and those that took it out of the state. So we, we have processes of collisions out of the state P minus processes of incoming collisions. So this was incoming And this was an out, outgoing uh, part of the collision integral. So what we said that if we look at the function at the density of electrons in the phase space at the point P, then on average, there will be electrons coming to this state from everywhere else. And this is the expectation value of the flux into the state P. And this is the expectation value of the, on the flux out of the state, incoming and outgoing part. And we said that on average, the average flux between these two states 
is given by WPP prime F of P one minus F of P prime. Or more carefully WPP prime F of P R and T one minus F of P prime R and T. So that was a flux. So we said collision integral is actually given by competition of two fluxes. One is a flux of electrons coming to the state P and one and, and another flux is a flux of particles going out of the state. Incoming and outgoing particles. And on average, on average, we know these fluxes and we, we, we wrote an expression for these fluxes, this is what it is. But the key comment here that this is only on average. So we're saying there is a, a flux between state P and P prime. On average, this flux is given by this very natural, very natural formula, but this is, how many electrons go between state P and P prime on average. In fact, if you would be able to measure the flux, the current between two states, P and P prime in the phase space, you will have a thought experiment. And if in the thought experiment, an experimentalist would have an ampermeter that measures currents in the phase space, he would observe that these currents have some fluctuations in time. Yeah? So schematically, if, if you would measure, it's impossible to measure, but if, if you have a sort of experiment that this thing would have some sort of inherited noise in it. Because collisions by themselves are random. And then to mimic this noise, we are saying we're gonna add, so we, to mimic the noise that is encoded in this collision, we add a term which is a Boltzmann Langevin term, which sorry, it's a Langevin current to the right hand side of the Boltzmann equation. And now that's that of course sounds very very nice, but now we need to now we need to define define this Langevin noise because Langevin noise is defined only if you say something about its statistics. Now, I don't know how many of you learned about Langevin equation in one form or another. Okay. Who else? Please raise your hand, those who know what Langevin equation is. Uh, can you maybe show it? I'm not strong with the numbers. Because before, before I'm gonna... Before I'm gonna discuss the properties of this flux, I want to make sure that you know the basics of an Langevin equation. Just think. Okay, so someone doesn't know what it is. Okay, people. It means that we need to spend more time on describing Langevin equation that than 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 I thought. But that's okay. Uh, because we have like I guess four more lectures left. Um, okay, so let let us make a detour because it's an important conceptual uh, conceptual step, which I assume that you all know, and I was wrong. Okay, so, 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 
The problem is that, that I cannot do it in a hurry. If I'll do it in a hurry, thinking what to do. How about this? We stop now for today and I'll prepare and I'll prepare separate. I need at least half an hour to to, to describe to describe Langevin equation because so so it's, maybe you heard about it under a different name, but but okay, I'll, I'll try I'll try now and see how if I manage to say something coherent. Um, uh, it came it came and came from 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 uh, Langevin when people started to think about random processes. Um, it does not really matter for us which random process. Suppose you have, suppose you have a particle. Okay, I'll, I'll try, I'll do my best. Suppose you have a particle uh, and its coordinate is, uh, let, let's make it one dimensional, its coordinate is X. And um, and this is a, this is a particle of um, of a of a gas. It's a particle of a gas. Let's think about this as a as a being a molecule. Now, if this molecule is left alone, its 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 equation of motion is given by second law of Newton. So it means dv over dt times mass is equal to zero. So just a freely moving particle. And um, uh, you can you can add you can add a say particle in the in the electric field. Uh, and then and then that will be and that will be again uh, second uh, law of Newton and nothing spectacular. But now imagine that you have this molecule, a big molecule, and it's surrounded by a gas. It's surrounded by a gas of light molecules. So it's, or, or you can think about some biological, biological uh, cell moving in the fluid and it's surrounded by, by all kinds of objects around it. Then what happens, but probably it's better to think in terms of gas. So you have a heavy particle, have a molecule in the, in the air and it's being hit by by small molecules, all small molecules all the time. So obviously, obviously what you're gonna do, you say, okay, so there are some kicks by external particles. So I would add some forces from, from the gas particles on, on my, on the particles I'm, on the particle I'm following, on my target particle, there are forces, forces, um, that are that are acting on it. Now, if I think about it, so what what is this force? So there is a small particle. It comes. It hits. It scatters off. So if if you will draw this force as a function of time, it will schematically look like it's zero zero zero. Then there is a short spike and then it goes to zero again. Then you wait an unknown amount of time, another molecule hits it, hits it probably in an opposite direction, then another one, then another one. 
So you see that if there are many, many uncorrelated molecules around, then typically what would happen to the dynamics of these particles that you add to the equation of motion forces that you have absolutely no control over. And these forces are random. So unless you're playing of solving a system of 10 and the power 23 particles together, then uh, even on the classical level, you see that equation of motion is essentially stochastic. So you have an object here, which is, which you cannot really compute. And this is called, so instead of, instead of computing it, then you say, okay, I, I'm giving up any hope of computing it. And I'm giving a hope of computing the velocity of my particles. V is a function of T. What I'm gonna do instead, what I'm gonna do instead, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna compute an average velocity of my particle as a function of time. And I'm also gonna compute a correlation function of the velocity of, of the particle as a function of time. And again, average means either with respect to many time long time windows, each one is long enough, or with respect if you wanna compute it with respect to the density matrix of the system, uh, as you wish. And then how do I compute it? I say, okay, so I have this, this thing and I'm gonna treat this, this part of the equation as a random variable, as a random variable. So what I'm gonna say that on average, if I look at this equation on the average, on average, then M D V average with respect to T is my old known second law of Newton plus random force on average. And if molecules of the gas hit the target molecules randomly, I have all reasons to believe that this guy on average is just equal to zero. However, however, if I now gonna solve the equation for the uh, velocity fluctuations, things are different. So let me, let me separate, let me separate fluctuations and, and mean part. So what I'm gonna say, let me divide, let me first of all solve an average equation. You know what, let for simplicity consider no electric field just to, to make my point. So MDV over DT, will be purely given by gas. In this case, average velocity is being just a constant. The simplest, the simplest case possible. Then V as a function of time will be one over M integral from minus infinity or from whatever point you choose till T dt1 F gas as a function of T1. Then if you will be interested in correlation function V of T, V of zero, this boils down to computing one over M integral from minus infinity to T dt one, integral from minus infinity to zero dt two, F gas T one, F gas T two, average. And here I say, okay, I have, I have no idea what, what is the microscopic uh, realization of, of this 
random force exerted by gas molecules on the target molecule. However, I can say it on, a, on average, this object is pretty clear. And this is what Langevin did a few hundred years ago. Now, I didn't prepare this lecture, so I, I don't remember really the details, but essentially, if there are collisions by different molecules in time, it's natural to assume that force extracted at different moments in time are uncorrelated. So there is a, some short, very short memory of this of these random forces. And probably the magnitude of this of these forces is proportional to temperature because the highest the temperature of, of, of the of the of, of the gas, the, the faster they hit me, the, 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 the stronger they hit the target. And probably there is some coefficient that has something to do with, this, with the viscosity of this gas. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't remember it on a more microscopic level, but that's schematically how it looks like. And then if, if you'll, I probably missing here something, but not something crucially important. And, and then if, if, if I use this assumption, I get that V as a function of T, V as a function of zero, will be proportional to one over M square, temperature and viscosity, and the integral dt1, dt2, this is to zero, this is to T of delta T1 minus T2. So this is the this is the essentially the the idea the idea of describing describing fluctuations of some quantity uh, by 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 adding to the equation what is called a random noise term in this case this was a random random force and then if you know from some physical arguments this the, the statistics of this random force for example you say there are lots of particles that are coming and kicking the the particle i follow and therefore each and every scattering event will be completely uncorrelated with all other scattering events. And if there is a very short memory of the scattering because each collision is practically instantaneous, then I, based on these type of arguments, I can, I can claim that there is a correlation function of the random forces, uh, which I justify and I, and I added to the to the uh, to the equation as a what they call Langevin source. So that was my very short summary of the of the Langevin equation. If you feel that you need a more thorough summary, I can I can prepare you uh, it for the for the next time. Uh, okay. So so what is happening here is to some extent similar to what to what to what I just described for um, uh, for Boltzmann equation. Uh, sorry for 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 Langevin equation. We need to add a term which is a Langevin noise for for Boltzmann equation. So it's an analog of a Langevin force for 
for a heavy molecule that is moving in the presence of, of uh, light molecules. But, but that's a very, uh, that's just an analog. So I'm adding here a random, a random source, a random term that depends on the momentum coordinate and time. And to say anything about uh, fluctuations, I need to specify the statistic properties, statistic properties of the random source. So like, like for the random source in Boltzmann equation, we said that it's delta correlated and it's proportional to the temperature and viscosity. So we need to, to postulate things about, about a, um, random, random term that we just added to Boltzmann equation. By the way, this term has a name, it's called, this equation has a name and this term has a name. So the equation that I, when the Langevin source was added to the right hand side of this equation, it's called Boltzmann, 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 Langevin, Langevin equation of nature. And to fully, to fully define this equation, I need to, I need to define the correlation, the statistics properties, the statistical property of the random flux. Yeah, so this term is called random flux. All the, uh, yeah, random flux. And I claim that I will be able to justify, I will be able to, to build this correlation function using the same logic I used to build collision integral. So I claim that just based on semi-classical intuition of what's going on, I will be able to, to postulate the correlation function of the random fluxes in the same way I postulated the structure of collision integral. So we understand the structure of collision integral from the same building blocks, we can, we can understand the structure of this random flux correlation function. It's essentially a continuation of the same story, continuation of the same ideas, but, but, uh, But it require, will require some 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 um, thinking. So I suggest I suggest we stop here. Uh, and next time maybe I'll, I'll prepare a, a more a more organized uh, summary of Langevin of Langevin uh, classical Langevin theory. Uh, in case, in case, uh, we need a reminder, and and then, and then I'll uh, systematically uh, describe the the construction of the of the um, uh, correlation function of random of random fluxes or Langevin sources. Sometimes people call them Langevin sources or Langevin currents for the Boltzmann equation. They have the same. <laughs> They have the same um, meaning as Langevin sources and Langevin equation, but they they depend on a, on a more variables, and they they also build these statistics is built from the same blocks as as collision integral, and and I think it allows us to understand collision integrals slightly deeper than than and than we did before. Uh, okay, people, I I believe it's 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 a time to stop. 
um, because because the next step is is pretty pretty important. I don't want to do it in a hurry and have enough of uh, lectures to cover all the material. Uh, so if, if you have any questions or comments, let's let's discuss. Yeah, so um, we will be able to derive this this correlator of currents uh, of delta J, right? Derive in the same. So, if you, if you believe that we have derived the collision integral, then the answer is yes. Mm. You'll be able to argue and construct it and explain it. Yeah. It's an intuitive uh, justification more than. Uh, it's not that we're gonna compute diagrams and derive it. Yeah, you can do it, but the rather we're gonna construct it and argue that that's the reasonable way. Yeah. Yeah, and the average here is, is um, like uh, tray, uh, like the usual average with trace and uh, like finite temperature. Uh, but notice not the finite temperature because we, we can discuss equilibrium situation in each case. It will be an average. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 sure. But actually, it will imply an average with some non-equilibrium density matrix, where even mm -hmm. the concept of, concept of temperature may not be defined. The only thing which is needed, actually, is that you can define single particle density matrix and describe this theory in terms of a single particle density matrix. But that's the concept that we always assume as soon as we wrote Boltzmann equation. If you can, if you can, if you can, if you can uh, limit your description to single particle density matrix without without involving. Uh, many body objects, like many particle density matrices. So if you can do that, then, then, then that's, that's what we are doing. Right, so, so one of the key assumptions of Boltzmann equation was that system is, is describable in terms of single particle distribution function. It's not always the case. Yeah? Yeah, so what, what we ex essentially did, we took our um, distribution function, which is a function of time, and then we represented it as a time, in like F time independent part, which is average over, like F average over time, plus in some correction. Not time independent part and not corrections. The, the, your intention is good, but the wording is wrong. So even in the Boltzmann equation, the distribution function was time dependent. Yeah. yeah. It was just coarse grained. It's not equation of dependence or independence. It was in the previous, in the previous episode of our series. It, we only consider coarse grained, coarse grained uh, uh, distributions, coarse grained uh, densities of particles in the phase space. Now we allow for these objects to fluctuate. So the coarse graining is, okay, you divide your phase space into the uh, blocks and then uh, so you, you average the distribution function f um, with respect to say a statistical ensemble. Uh, 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 yeah, like w within the blow, you you kind of uh, integrate f uh, over p and r within the block and divide by the volume of the block or something like that. Correct. Correct. And and you call this object as a, a, a like coarse grained uh, distribution function. Correct. Ah, okay, okay, okay. And now I say, so, and then and then I and then I, and then I take it back and say, okay, that's not the whole story. Actually, the number the number of the particles in each box in each cell that I coarse grained and computed and studied, it's what it is. It's coarse grain version. Now I'm gonna say, no, that's. Let me look at this number in its full glory. So now I will consider this number. As a fluctuating quantity. Yeah. So uh, this this 
<laughs> so when you write uh, average, you mean average over the block? Roughly, yeah. Uh, kind Fourth of grade over the, over, the, over the cell, yeah? So essentially, this delta j is like coarse grained uh, uh, collision integral <laughs> or something like that. No, delta j coarse grain is zero because now I'm going to say the collision integral was essentially coarse grain collision integral. Mm -hmm. So there is a more microscopic object that fluctuates, there is a lag there. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a random, the collisions are random process. And therefore, with, with any type of collision, there is a randomness and associated, associated lunge event source. If I coarse grain it, then I get just an expectation, a mean flux between one state in the phase space and another. That's how many electrons on average go from the state P to the state P prime in the, in the phase space. So there is, a, there is a box number P and there is a box number P prime in the phase space. And on average, there is a flux that goes between these two boxes. So like I said, like I said, there's on average number N of P and N of P prime particles in these boxes. And there's an on average, a current, which I call the collision integral that flows between these two, between these two blocks. Mm -hmm. However, in fact, this is also a random process. And now I need to, to understand something about this random process that something that allows me not only say what is on average, because if you look at, at the notes, we know that on average, the, the current is a sum of incoming and outgoing parts. And on average, the physical meaning of both terms is pretty transparent. So on average, you have a number of particles between P to P prime. It's a number of particles in the box P times how many vacancies you have in the box P prime times the probability to scatter from P to P prime. So for looking, looking just, just look by looking at this expression and, and exploring it, you can see that there are some certain stochastic, stochastic random processes that are being, that are being um, implied here, yeah? So mm -hmm. for example, you see there is a number of particles F in this cell P, R, and T, but we know there is no such a thing like a number of particles in PR in the cell PR. Oh, no. There's a number of particles in this cell on average. However, this number will fluctuate. So if it will fluctuate, obviously the, the, associated, the associated flux will fluctuate. There's also a number of vacancies on average there. It also fluctuates just due to the thermal fluctuations. And moreover, there is this guy that tells you what is the probability to be scattered between P and P prime, but that's, that's also something being on average. So there are, there are several interfined random processes here. So if you look at it like that, you understand that there are several random processes that are completely uncorrelated. So we'll discuss these processes next time. And then if you understand the statistics of each and every process, we should be able to understand what is the statistics of fluctuations of the random flux in the Boltzmann equation. Okay, thanks. Welcome. More questions, comments. Well, if not, let us let us meet uh, next week.